delighted to have you back on our program, which is ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. This is the 266 show, which I thought last week was, but I guess not. And you are about to be our 14,360s viewer. Thank you for that. We appreciate it. And we, as your host, uh, DeSoto Brown in his Bishop Museum. Hi, DeSoto. Good day to everybody. And myself, Martin Despang, from his bathroom studio in the Waikiki Grand <laughs> in Waikiki, Honolulu. And we have our guest back, Matt Noblet, uh, this time from Cincinnati, Ohio. Hi, Matt. Hello. Good afternoon. Or whatever it whatever is. It morning, is. I guess. Yeah. Yes. It's morning here. Yes. <laughs> Five o'clock somewhere, as Jimmy Buffett sings. Right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's true, too. So you've been um, safely back, Matt. You went to Munich and all the way back, and then they detoured you to uh, through Cincinnati. So, And you're going to be with us in a couple of days. And can yes. we get the first slide up for that, please? <laughs> We look obviously much forward to uh, having you and hear, um, you know, an extended version and um, a lot more illustrated than we can do in this, which is going to be going on for quite a while, as we're happy to do. And um, as we're always uh, looking at things with, uh, you know, different views, um, I have to thank you for having your colleague Michelle had been on our review, our studio review last week, and she reported back to you all the school of architecture looks really awesomely tropically exotic so just so you're not too shocked when you come to where this your poster is this is going to be uh that place and even worse we're going to drag you into an all um enclosed hermetic a seed auditorium so yes i've been i've been there i know the place <laughs> so you you've been there so it's not too much of a shock um, but um, before the show, um, you know, we've been talking about how the School of Architecture should have been, and we realized it could have been, you know, a project of yours, which I think John Hara likes to hear, and is a good compliment, because what we see at the top right in the show quote, how he had designed it originally, has a lot to do with how you guys design, you know, it's very easy breezy, open and airy, courtyards, orientation is right, fenestration is right. What you barely see in DeSoto, you pointed this out, that there is it, it, it dates itself as far as being the early 90s, which are these most lovable memories that Matt, you and I have from our <laughs> architectural <laughs> education. <laughs> And there, there is a little, uh, there is a little dating at a uh, little gazebo, little pavilion there as a, as a folly, uh, a foolish folly there, which we don't really see. But that's about it, you know. But the building he did, he did right, and then he gave his little zeitgeist poop there on the side, which doesn't doesn't <laughs> hurt anyone. So. Anyway, so, um, well, that was then and now is now. And wouldn't you think uh, 40 was like, no, not that bad. 30 years later, and we don't make it worse than it is, things should um, have improved. But next slide. Uh, this is in your uh, home away from home, your Hawaii home away from home, because this is that you shared with us in Kailua, where you um, every now and then reside with your family. Mm -hmm. And this is me in your Kailua and the food land looking at some goofy version of my turtles at the top right. They're floating up there under the ceiling. But um, what was really a shock um, was when we checked out at the cashier and there was the star advertiser. You see the title page top left. There was still leaving some you know, hope because I uh, didn't show the backside yet, which we see at the bottom left, which as to the origin of the paper was upside down. So I needed to like the cashier got annoyed at me by that time because she was thinking, why the hell isn't he buying it? But <laughs> I didn't want to waste any money for that. Uh, and then I, we went on <clears throat> online immediately and fought and saw what we uh uh we 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 see what we what what, what we realize on on the bottom right. And once again, in this new tradition of our last show, I know what you guys are going to say. You're going to say, don't judge a book by a cover and let's wait for it to be revealed more. But probably like with the last project, which was, by the way, by the same developer, Kobayashi Group, I guess there isn't much left to 
uh, give us some hope. So let's discuss <laughs> a little bit what we see here. Well, I wanted to point out first that uh, the, the way this all developed is kind of interesting in that the announcement about this project occurred just a few days before the review of the zoning variance occurred. And in fact, it did get the zoning variance. So that I think means that it has gotten a green light to potentially proceed. Obviously, if, of course, finances is not going to make, it's going to make a huge difference as to whether it actually happens or not. But uh, it is, I do understand what's going on here. They're talking about replacing an area that is just filled with small 50s and 60s, two-story walk-up buildings that are not in very good shape. And obviously those are going to be uh, very low uh, cost to rent. So they're talking about replacing it with something which would, again, uh, potentially accommodate those people who are displaced. And I do also understand why the variance was granted, probably, because directly across the street, this is pretty much on the corner of Date Street and Kapiolani Boulevard, on Kapiolani, just, you know, a short distance away, there are already multiple very tall high-rise buildings. So it's not as though this is being built in the middle of absolutely nothing. And I think that's probably why it's happened. And again, as I said, because it's gotten a state variance, I think that this means that uh, the, any county variance is kind of superseded. What we do not see in this rendering is if there are any lanais or not on these buildings. It doesn't look as though there are. So immediately that's something that we don't like if in fact that's the case because hermetically sealed buildings without access to the open air in our tropical climate are not things that we are happy about. Well, I'm, my, my question was, <clears throat> what does moderately priced mean in Honolulu? I mean- <laughs> Yeah, that's a very good point. I, are we supposed to be really reassured by the fact that they're going to be moderately priced? <clears throat> yeah, right, right. And we don't know what that means in terms of actual numbers either. Yeah, but I mean, I have to say too, you know, we see this on the East Coast as well, where um, the, the land acquisition and development costs are just so exorbitantly high that the only way, you know, not maybe not the only way, but certainly the most direct way to recoup your, your costs is to just pile square footage on top that uh, is revenue generating. And I think that's, you know, it, 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 in, not, to, not to defend development too strongly, but I think that is a core, you know, sort of concern, something you have to get to the bottom of if you really want to do more, you know, like what I would consider intelligent kind of development in a place like that, right? I mean, I, I think density is not a bad thing inherently. I think that looks like an insane amount of density uh, in a place that, you know, really, really has too much of that probably. But, um, you know, certainly something mid-rise or low-rise high density is far, would be far more palatable and potentially give you the opportunity to do a lot of the things that you're talking about. I just don't think you'd ever get that many units in, you know, you'd need so much more land to do that. Yeah, and again, well, architecturally, mm -hmm. I mean, this looks like you said, you know, this could happen over there in Boston. And this could actually, not that it should be in Boston because it would be as ugly there as it is here. Might be but more. But performatively, yeah, performatively, at least it would work there, you know, in some <laughs> well, way yeah. with its wall architecture. But here, I mean, I, what amazes me is that people don't get it, that most of the cost, as Matt, you and I coming from practice, know is within the fenestration. I mean, mm -hmm. the reason why developers want to basically lower the ceiling, the ceiling height, the clearance, is not because of the cubic inches of concrete for the columns. That's relatively minor, right? Mm -hmm. But it's the square footage of costly fenestration of facades. So by bringing, getting things more easy breezy, you automatically make it way more, as they like to call it, affordable. And they just yeah. don't, don't get that. They don't, this is an untapped opportunity <clears throat> that they really don't, don't see. And I, uh, you know, making a reference to your, uh, your guys, Unilever and the Marco Polo Tower, in Hamburg, um, I've been doing a, a show a long time ago, actually, in the, if you look for it in the playlist, you find, won't find it under human human architecture, but urban transcendence, which a previous one was called. And I did one that we called um, Germany's Kakaako, Hamburg's Harbor City. <laughs> and the quintessence is that the reason why it is so successful is because it's exact opposite as far as 
uh, the uh, political framing that the city once uh, that land was very cheap and worth nothing because they went from the old barges and the warehouses where they brought up the coffee and the oriental, oriental carpets in bags and that shifted to container which mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. here too that shift at that point the city snapped the land and then basically gave it on hands to developers with serious homework uh, one of them being architectural competitions in most mm -hmm. cases or in many cases then high you know standards of mixed use and ecological performance and that's mm -hmm. why you see one interesting building next to the other one because of that political framing and here yeah, yeah. You seem to give land to developers and then you have no no saying anymore right you have no as you said the soto they were throwing out the way this monster would look like like seconds before the politicians had to okay it right yeah that's so certainly I mean, the way it worked out yeah yeah i mean hoffman city is a really interesting example martin because um you know the other things a couple of the other interesting things that they did there was they required the developers to pull permits on their projects within six months of uh, acquiring the property which meant that they had to have an architectural competition select the design and actually get going and they didn't give them enough time to pull a fast one uh, by sort of substituting the competition with winners with more mediocre architects you know who would be more pliable to the to to their pro forma needs uh and then i think the other thing that hoffman city did very very well was um was uh you know there's there is energy infrastructure that's in place that they uh, all the buildings were able to take advantage of so all of this speaks to a level of political will that we don't find in the us um right an investment up front um but it doesn't mean there's not things you can learn from that either no and we sort of uh, probably we think the soto you and i think probably intentional we always get Sten senator stanley chang's newsletter just before the show so uh <laughs> we should actually get him on a show and discuss this and 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 you just i want to have your opinion because again they already named this project which i you know put in here at the bottom right so Kui lay place right okay so, that's it that's the name of the street that's already there okay and it's actually but and but the the it's interesting you bring that up because the word place means a street that's a dead end so mm -hmm. this is a small dead end street that serves a very low density neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So this is going to go into a place where they're going to have to redo the streets at least in order to service this. And that is something that has come up in other situations where a really big building has been built that's only can be served through a very inadequate small skinny street. Obviously, I hope in this case that's not going to happen, but that has happened in other places in Honolulu, and it's very aggravating for everybody who already lives there to suddenly have thousands of people, hundreds if not thousands of people, constantly coming in and out of a huge development there where the infrastructure cannot handle that. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that's not going to happen there. Let's keep our fingers crossed that that's not something else that's dumped upon this whole yeah. thing that we're but looking I'm at. I'm, I'm probably not mistaken if, I mean, they have a good excuse now since you gave it to them, rightly so, because it's a street name. So they can say, well, we just named it after the street. That's right. But that's right. There's a reason why they named the street after, you know, and this is, I looked it up. It's the lay maker, but it also has to do something with children. So again, the building seems, again, I'm, I, I keep saying this is probably political ethically incorrect, but I say it anyways, this seems like the new Soviet Union architecturally is re-emerging here uh, with us or Henselmann, the old GDR's master plan architect, because this is like the most watered down, uninspired, um, you know, modernism that you can think of. And by the way, we know this from Ludwig Hilbersheimer, who was that hardcore rationalist, but I had a hard time believing, but I had to admit it's true that the all American cold as suck is actually an invention by um, by Hilbersheimer. And while oh, we, right? yeah, and it actually has, of course, some some sort of, you know, um, soft qualities to it that the kids can play there and relatively safe. But the origin is actually rationality to 
put as many you know houses on mm -hmm. as few mm -hmm. streets as possible so that's mm -hmm. something very very american right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um i i threw in this probably two small show quote at the on the right in the middle that is because you guys were saying a big thing and a monster. This is the Ili Kai. And then there's this funny postcard, the soda that you provided where someone threw that lay over, over the whole big thing, talking lay, kui lay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is a, it's a big, I mean, this, this is, this was a big shock in Waikiki. All of a sudden this monster yeah. grew up, right? Yeah. But again, um, it, it has, um, it has some flair, even though it seems proportionally and uh, even architecturally with a double loaded corridor. But when you analyze a thing, which we periodically do, uh, always one of the sides is always shaded by the other one. It is all a night. So as you said, Matt, it's not size, right? It's really the attitude uh, and the Haltung, as we call it in German, uh, mm -hmm. behind. And here it just seems, I mean, this... This brown color is just the vertical circulation, uh, likely the elevators, because I don't think this has any of what the Primitivas have, is reintroducing the Hamburg Hafen City uh, uh, old hamster wheel wooden uh, uh, <laughs> elevator on the roof, right? That's not <laughs> happening here. So Unlikely. this is just uh, this is just the elevators and the and the staircases along with it, and, and that's gonna make up the 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 antlets the the face of of the building and then they shove microwave glass units in between i mean this is this is really shocking i mean in the last one and that's probably depends on again client and scope of the project but the one from last week at least had some ambitions and mm -hmm. using using which we said we don't give them uh, you know the full lanai legitimacy as a term but we said at least balconies but this one here yeah sad and and one last sad one before we get the spirit up and hopefully that by then we're not at the end of the show otherwise but get the next <laughs> slide up and go through that fast and the the right side there uh, is by you Matt and 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 tell us how you ran across it and your thoughts about it Oh, well, I, we happen to be um, looking for, for housing for my wife's father um, towards the end of his life a few years ago, back in 2016, I think. And we, we visited this place after, right after it was built. And uh, I, I don't think I saw the outside until after I'd, we'd gone inside. Like there's a kind of a port cochere and you go in and up. And as we were leaving, I looked up at the building and I thought, my God, I haven't seen anything quite so absurd in my whole life. Um, I was actually tickled when you and, and Bundit told me that uh, before they installed the actual window air conditioning units, you were optimistic that these little these little uh, hats were like sun shading for the glass. But <laughs> it turns out it's just keeping the, the rain off of the, wind, the air conditioning units. Um, I mean, it really is almost like a, I mean, I hate to be too critical, but it almost is like a, like a postcard for anti-sustainable, for the least possible sustainable uh, design you could hope to achieve. Yeah, it's absolutely cynical. And yeah, we were actually, once again, just like giving things the benefit of the doubt that don't deserve it. But here we thought, <laughs> you know, the, the small domestic size vertical wind turbines <laughs> along these lines we were like so naive thinking they would be on top of these right and oh, reaching oh, yeah, out yeah. into the breeze yeah well oh well oh well yeah, and, yeah. yeah. i mean and, i don't uh, talk about design here at all i just talk about pure yeah. and you know these are this is the least efficient way to cool if you're going to cool the building this is really about as, as inefficient as you could possibly hope to make it yeah but you go <laughs> you guys were saying they probably bought them in a bundle at Home Depot oh, yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah I have yeah, a feeling yeah. Home Depot was out of air conditioners for like two years while this was going up. <laughs> and and that not enough, uh, you know, Bundit's beautiful building in Molo Ely that he's unfortunately uh, DeSoto still not allowed to talk about because he got dragged into these nasty lawsuits and stuff like that. So on the walking tour on Saturday, the Dokomomo walking tour, we had one of the you know, guides basically being from the uh, Fort Street Mall Redevelopment Board or something like that. And he was um, 
he was happy to see, and, and actually the uh, behind it, which is a Joe Paul Rungstedt uh, high rise, it gets converted into a Marriott. So that's kind of reverse. Usually, you know, we talked the, the Pomo piece of cake along Bishop Street was uh, office and is now dwelling. Uh, never mind hermetic invasive dwelling, but this one here gets <laughs> sort of converted the wrong way from dwelling to hotel. So he was happy what was going on, and and uh, one can understand that. But then, and there's also a good uh, met right to uh, bring people not at the outskirts into the burbs, but you know in sort of towards more the core of the city. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. shoving them away into these you know air conditioned warehouse boxes is then rather cynical, right? So and it's the same. And this this is so this is the next choice, obviously not. But guess what? This is the next senior housing. Oh, I wondered what that was going to be. Yeah. Oh, OK. Well, and I'm once, heading towards senior. And, and once again, oh. uh, Matt, we're back. <laughs> this is this is this is back to the back to not back to the yeah back to the future. This is us in school, Matt. We're still in school. Doesn't that look like from 1991 when we were traumatized? I'm I'm constantly amazed how that the that the grip of postmodernism has has been especially strong in Hawaii over the the time that I've been there, and it's still it's not it's not cons, it's not as pervasive as it once was, but you still see uh, yeah traces of it. Let's say yeah yeah, and tragic circle here, a vicious circle is that Bundit then said you know. Looking down, he said, well, the, the, the developer guy here is the same one that's involved in, in you know, the, the nasty stuff around his beautiful building there. So it's just like, where's the ethics, right? Well, the ethics shows in the absence of ethics here. So now we have to get the spirit back up. And this is all proof <laughs> of evidence why we need that your BBB, your Boston Banish boost so badly here as another B. <laughs> And what that will be, can be, should be, we reconnect to with the next slide with a show quote from last week, how we ended, and then uh, showing uh, your colleague, and I'm intentionally not calling him your boss, Stefan <laughs> Danish there. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is, uh, I mean, this is only half of a slide that really is, I mean, the, speaking to the part on the right here is just about a slide we always use to talk about how important it is to dress appropriately for the climate that you live in, right? I mean, this need, this kind of almost insatiable need for cooling <clears throat> and, and energy uh, to, to create comfort is often done. Um, so I mean, it's definitely done on the East Coast where I live. And, um, you know, I think to some extent, Hawaii is actually a little bit more reasonable about this with, you know, the Aloha shirt and uh, the kind of broad acceptance of that as, as formal wear as well as leisure wear. But most places you go, people insist still on wearing three piece three piece suits in the middle of, you know, say August. Uh, if you go to City Hall in Boston, you have to uh, look like all the all the regulators who you're meeting with. and um, and it's absurd, right? I mean, you sit there freezing, even with your jacket on and your tie, um, and and the energy that we have to use to create those conditions of comfort is absurd. It's really so. That's that's the sort of the genesis of that. And then, of course, um, this is something that with all of our work, our employees and uh, and colleagues in the office, we're constantly uh, advocating for in our projects, which is before we even talk about technical kind of gadgets and, and and techniques to to make buildings more comfortable or perform better we have to as people actually improve our performance right and create the best conditions for success for for buildings yeah and with that we you just qualified to be back on another show of ours that's the longest <laughs> in the making we don't know when it ever will happen but we have a working title for it and that one is address code address code mm -hmm. so and and it's an interesting because DeSoto with your ancestry and them different to other you know native american tribes that really never made it anywhere else with all respect than into their immediate surroundings the hawaiian royalty was all over the place all over the world if you go into Iolani Palace, they were part of the crowning 
ceremony of the czar and the queen and the German Kaiser and all these people. And of course, going there, they had to bundle up. <laughs> but as you taught me to soda and continue to do, they also wanted to because they didn't want to come across as the wild people from somewhere at the mm -hmm. most remote corner in the world. Right. But then as I then, uh, you know, wh who am I to criticize your royalty? But I'm saying when they came back, which the Prince Gohio uh, bronze statue on uh, Kalakaua reminds me every morning, he should have undressed again, which he didn't for various reasons. And well, one of the reasons, yeah, but the reason he is dressed up is because he also was in Washington, D.C. So mm -hmm. that's why he had to dress like that a lot of the time because he was interacting with all these people who wear suits, what we just were talking about. And yeah, so yeah. he had to play that game. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's many more facets to that. They're fascinating. So we, again, have to at some point do that show and then we're yes. going to have you, Matt, yes. on it. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, Matt, be you've, been, you've been hooked into this. You don't realize it, but you, you've been... <laughs> <laughs> Martin has his claws in you now for this is for this is the long term thing. Just so you like know, fly, like flypaper. Yeah? It's right. You're you're stuck. You're on the flypaper now. You're never getting away. <laughs> the Soto knows how it is. Oh yeah, it happened to him so many oh, years yeah. ago. Now it did. It did. Yes. So while we would not have time uh, to talk about the line, the next slide, we will still show it as an appetizer uh, because we're at the end of the show already. But this is how we will pick up. Uh, Next, well, next week we take a break because you have to do logistically. So we're going to do one with Ron about uh, Chicago and Honolulu, another strange pair. But <laughs> the week after we will reconvene. And this is uh, obviously also what you will see and hear on Monday when you please all come to met your lecture at the School of Architecture on Monday the 24th at 6 p.m in this uh, chilled auditorium. And once <laughs> at the end of it, we're all gonna rush outside to awesome poo-poos and great talk <laughs> with Matt, uh, which is even better. So looking, looking much forward. forward to that. Yeah, yes, us too. equally. Awesome. Okay, until then, stay all planet and people friendly and uh, see you all next week and see you all on Monday. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.